Good afternoon. Welcome to Hartford Public Library, uh, our downtown branch. You're in the Center for Contemporary Culture. And uh, we're delighted tonight to have uh, with us uh, the world's strongest librarian. Um, Josh uh, Hanagarn is a lifelong Tourette syndrome sufferer who's developed strength, resilience, and a life-affirming sense of humor in the face of overwhelming challenges. Uh, for those of you who've read his book or when you do read his book, The World's Strongest Librarian, it's a memoir of faith and strength and the power of family. Uh, Josh offers a humorous and moving account of his battle with Tourette's, his love affair with books, his attempt to navigate his tenuous Mormon faith, and his revelatory and healing venture into weightlifting. Um, he first began experiencing symptoms of Tourette's at the age of six. For the next 30 years, he wrestled with it, which he eventually nicknamed Misty, short for Miss T. The Tourette uh, symptoms, verbal and facial tics, body spasms, self-inflicted punches increased and intensified as he grew older, and moments of calm were few and far between. So weightlifting became Josh's most reliable refuge and challenged and changed him both physically and emotionally. It gave him the confidence to return to school, but of course, Miss T refused to retreat. Finally, at his urging, Josh turned to the most successful medical treatment he would attempt. He froze his vocal cords with the use of Botox, uh, which suppressed his verbal tics, but also reduced his voice to a whisper over a three-year period of time. Uh, but during that time, he was able to ded dedicate himself to education and to building relationships and to ultimately becoming a librarian in the Salt Lake City system. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Josh here, uh, not simply because he's a, a fellow librarian, but because uh, he demonstrates such great resilience as a human being in the face of great physical challenges and uh, every day seeks to overcome them and has developed a way to do that and I think represents a great um, uh, guide for us. Uh, we do have his book available here tonight. Uh, Susie St Staubach in the back from Yukon Co-op has the books for sale and uh, Josh, of course, will sign them. And um, we also want, uh, want you want to thank the healthy uh, source catering uh, group which provided the food tonight. They also provide the delicious food over at the, uh, uh, the restaurant at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. So tonight um, I have the pleasure of introducing Josh uh, Hanagarn. Josh, want to come down? Along with, <laughs> along with uh, Jacques Lamar, someone that, someone that many of you may know, who's the Communication and Special Projects Director at the Mark Twain House and Center. Uh, Mark Twain <laughs> House and the Library are sponsoring this program tonight as part of its uh, adult summer uh, reading series, which we'll tell you about uh, after the program. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jacques and, and Josh uh, to um, uh, delight and entertain and educate us. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> All right, so are these, you guys can hear us okay? We're getting the thumbs up? About me, right. is that working okay? All right. All right. Well, thank you all for coming this evening, and we're so uh, thrilled. The Mark Twain House Museum is so thrilled to partner <laughs> with the uh, Hartford Public Library on this program, uh, as we have in, in the past with other programs, obviously. At the Twain House, we, uh, we love authors, and we love um, libraries, and so this is a perfect fit. And um, I just want to give a quick little thing. You got a great introduction uh, from Matt about, uh, about Josh. Um, I am an avid Facebooker. Those of you who, uh, who follow my page know that I'm, uh, I will pollute your news feed several times a day. Um, and there is an author that we brought to the museum two years ago uh, by the name of Joe Lansdale. And uh, Joe had received an advanced copy of The World's Strongest Librarian. And um, you know the book was not going to be out for months and months at that point, but he said, you know, that it's an amazing, amazing, powerful book and highly recommended that as soon as it comes out, uh, which was May of this year, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That we needed to, um, that people who followed him really should get their hands on it. 
And um, I went and looked it up, and I said, I've got <laughs> to get this guy to Hartford. So <laughs> I Facebook Josh, because he's also an avid Facebooker. And, avid. Uh, <laughs> and he, um, he was be so excited and so flattered to be asked by the Mark Twain house to come to Hartford, <clears> because <throat> one of his uh, heroes is Mark Twain. Um, and so he was so excited, and then once he heard uh, that we would be presenting him at the library, it was only too fitting uh, due to his job at the um, Salt Lake City Library. Um, so and I couldn't, and they couldn't pay me, so I paid to come out. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also a huge Stephen <laughs> King fan, which you will find out when you read the book. Uh, and we have Stephen King coming tomorrow to Hartford. So uh, Josh will be providing uh, bodyguard service for Stephen King. It's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so he's doubly excited. And he got to tour Mark Twain's house, uh, and we gave him a bust of Mark Twain for his writing desk mm -hmm. at home, uh, which is what he, he said he would do this if we gave him a bust of Twain. So anyway, <laughs> thank you for coming. He's thank been you. touring all over. And, um, <laughs> and uh, again, he flew on his own dime. So we're really thrilled. Um, how has your life changed since the book has come out before we uh, get into the book itself? And well, I have a lot more to do. I, uh, honestly, I haven't read any of the reviews of the book. It, it's been in the New Yorker and Oprah's Magazine, and the first I generally hear of this stuff is the publicist will send me an email and say, and I'll, and I'll delete it because I can tell it's a review, <laughs> and then she'll follow up and say, did you see that you were in the New Yorker? And I'll say, no, was that email I deleted? <laughs> and she'll say, yes. Um, the, the biggest thing that has changed for me is I have gotten to see so many places and meet so many people that I just wouldn't be able to otherwise. And I wasn't really trying to become a writer. This, they they kind of came to me in a way a few years ago. And I've gotten to speak all over the country. I've, I'm given like 20 talks in October all over. I, I mean, it's, the book's being translated into Chinese and Korean right now. Hopefully I'll be Korea's favorite son soon. <laughs> They'll throw the gates open, and that'll be the book that did it. Uh, I, but honestly, when I think about what has changed for me, it's simply that I, I will get to talk to all of you tonight and get to meet you. And what, you know, how else would I wound up in this, in this library tonight? How else would I have gotten to meet all these people I'm getting to meet? And, and more importantly, the, the Tourette's community I meet, I've done a ton of, I do a ton of speaking for free in the disabilities community. And that's not a change, but there's more of it. And so that's uh, probably the change that matters to me the most. Gotcha. And uh, so you said they came to you. Was that because <laughs> of your, your blog? Or how did, they, how did they hear about your story? Uh, do any of you read my blog? Good. Nobody was supposed to. <laughs> so like four years ago, I, uh, I kept losing my strength training notebooks. I would write down my workouts, lose the notebooks. And if any of you train, I mean, that's, that's bad. You're always guessing where you were. You think you can remember, you can't. So <coughs> I had a friend say, well, why don't you just start a little blog, write your numbers down, you'll always know where it is. So if you look at the earliest entries on the blog, it's seriously just these grids of numbers, and that's all it was ever gonna be. The, uh, I was kind of heavily into the fringe elements of the fitness world at this point. And so people would stop by and check on my workouts, and we'd chat a little bit in the comments. And little by little, I mean, we started conversing, what are you reading, blah, 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 how's the Tourette's, stuff like that. And then uh, the blog that nobody was supposed to read was about two months old when uh, there's an author and an entrepreneur named Seth Godin who lives in New York. <laughs> I woke up one morning to an email from Seth, and it said, I mean, I was aware of Seth, didn't know him. And it said, you should be writing a book. I'm sending this to my agent. So about 48 hours later, I had a literary agent for no reason. <laughs> and when she said, bless her heart, well, so what's the book? I kind of said, what book? You know? That was four years ago. I mean, it's taken a long time. And that's, uh, that's kind of how it started when I say they came to me. Um, mm -hmm. The story kept changing as I wrote the book, as my ticks came and went, as certain things changed, as I, as I met certain people. Once we finally settled on what it was going to be, it sold fairly quickly. And so what, <laughs> what would you say the book is about? If someone uh, said, I said to you what, because you, you're, <laughs> well, you're so multifaceted. And so <laughs> it's, you know, I, the subtitle is a memoir of Tourette's faith, strength, and the power of family. 
was your <laughs> was your intention to show that level of multifacetedness and how these things all interrelate, or are you like, I'm just telling my story and this is who I am? It's it's hard to say. I think that's what they would tell you. Mm -hmm. The appeal is the the publishers. Uh, I I've, I've never had any illusions that this is absolutely the best way to talk about my life. I just knew it was a way. It was the way I liked and that they liked, and it took a long time to get to it. I, I probably threw away close to 2,000 pages to wow. get to the 280 whatever that became the book. <laughs> if any of you ever want to know what do you actually think about the world, what, who, who am I, do I have opinions, what, what are they, if so, try to write them down. You, uh, you learn a, a lot about yourself, and when you write a memoir, it's a game of which periods in my life will I represent? Which episodes from those periods best represent th those times? And that's pretty much it. And those are, yeah. those are the stories you have here. So as far as the multifaceted stuff, um, yeah, I think it's interesting, but it's kind of a recent development. Uh, mm -hmm. Even five years ago, if I'd started writing this book, I wouldn't have been the guy who was leaving the Mormon church and could roll up frying pans with his hands and worked in a quiet library and had incredibly noisy Tourette's in the library. So yeah. I, had to, I had to figure out a way to get them all together because if I had done more of a traditional biography, I was born, then this, then this, all of what we're talking about is the good stuff would have been like in the last 10 pages, probably. Because yeah. whenever I would tell <laughs> someone you were coming, I'd be like, well, <laughs> this guy is uh, the world's strongest librarian, and he has Tourette's, and he's a former Mormon, <laughs> and whatnot. They're like, this is an insane story. But it doesn't read insane when you read I, it. See, and I kind of think it does. And when people say it's <laughs> raggedy, I, I kind of look at it as like a, a browse through a life. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's start with libraries, because that's probably, <laughs> along with your Mormon uh, background, some of your earliest memories surround libraries. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about your, your parents and books and what that meant to you as a kid. Okay. How many of you use this library? How many of you bring your kids here? Two! Okay. <laughs> I'll assume nobody else has kids who raised their hand. Uh, when I went to the library in Salt Lake, you can immediately spot the kids who are read to and who love books. And that was me. I, I mean, I never had a chance not to. I started being taken to the library before I was born. According to my mom, uh, stories were always just part of life. When I would come home from school at the end of the day, my, my parents would not say, how was your day? They would say, what did you ask? And that's just kind of the way it was. Libraries were just part of things. Were they avid readers too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad thinks fiction is a huge waste of time. My mom loves fiction, kind of a point of good nature disagreement with them, but they are both huge readers. And it, it was just always the way things were. My siblings are all the same. And would you read whatever you could get your hands on? Or was there certain stuff that you were drawn to as a kid? Pretty much. I didn't discriminate too much. You know, books were books. And sometimes that meant stuff that was too much too soon. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it just, it just it really didn't matter. I, I am probably the only professional strongman you will ever meet who's read all of the Sweet Valley High books <laughs> and, and the Babysitter's Club books. And I remember all the characters' names. Uh, you know, because that like would be a weekend where I was stranded 10 miles from the library. My mom said, I can't take you in this weekend. And so I read all my sister's books and got, and got hooked. I mean, it really just didn't matter. So who were your <coughs> favorite authors when you were little, little? Uh, wait, like how little? Well, I, we're going to get to Stephen King in a minute. I figure that's a transition like moment for you. like fifth grade, yeah. All right, so pre-fifth <laughs> grade... Who were you excited about? Uh, Pre-fifth grade, I loved Beverly Cleary. I loved E.B. White, all the Roald Dahl stuff. <laughs> um, pretty much, I, I read all the Newberries that were out. I loved mm -hmm. Lois Lowry. Just pretty much anything. It didn't matter. And I, the school librarians loved me, and they would always give me stuff. So I, Now, E.B. Uh, White oddly ties into your Tourette's with Charlotte's Web, correct? I don't know. We I don't want to blame E.B. White for it. No, no. But um, how many of you read Charlotte's Web? <laughs> okay, good. So the pig's name is Wilbur in the book. Um, when I was, uh, I start, <clears throat> I started having my first ticks, according to my parents, when I was in first grade, <laughs> and I was at a, 
I was in a Thanksgiving play. My teacher's name was literally Ms. Poindexter. <laughs> and she was casting the play, and she was saying, okay, you know, we need, we need pilgrims, we need a turkey, we need a bunch of squantos, who's going to do what? And I had fallen in love with Fern from Charlotte's Web about a week earlier. My mom caught me kissing this picture of Fern, <laughs> the farmer's daughter who saves this pig, Wilbur, in Charlotte's Web. And so when Ms. Poindexter said, I, I told her, I, I'm going to be a pig, I'm going to be Wilbur. And she said, no, he'll be a tree. Because I was already tall. And I said, okay, then I'll be a tree that oinks. And the tree's, <laughs> the tree's name is Wilbur. A anyway, so that's kind of where it, where it started with so, me and E.B. White. And <laughs> then, but it was about that time that you first started experiencing the, the ticks, correct? Uh, as far as I know, I don't... You know, it's hard, it's hard to know what your real memories are. Mm -hmm. I, I know that my parents would tell you the first time they saw me having tics, it was some eye blinking, head craning, was on that stage when those bright lights came up mm -hmm. and would just never stop again. Gotcha. Now, um, also, uh, before we get to uh, how Stephen King changed your life, uh, we, um, you were raised Ow! in the Mormon faith from birth, correct? Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, are there any Mormons in the audience? We're not putting anyone on spot, but yes, we are. Uh, no. um, uh, what was that like in your family? Were they super <laughs> religious, or were they you know, kind of practicing Mormons, but not... Like, I grew up in a very Catholic household. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and there are other people who are kind of you know, Catholic on Sundays and the rest of the week, mm -hmm. not so much. So how, how intense was the, was the religious... Um, was the faith in your household? You know, it was, uh, it was, it was not, in, intense isn't really the word, but yeah. definitely practicing. Mm -hmm. It's not like it was some gloomy, oppressive atmosphere. A very, very joyful family. Um, but, it, but again, kind of like with the library, it was simply the way things were. You, you really just don't ask those kind of questions when you're little. Uh, yeah. Church was on Sunday. We don't swear. We don't lie. We don't watch our other movies. You know, it was just kind of the way it was. All the fun stuff. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Mark, my, my vices are so lame, you guys. Diet. <laughs> Mark Twain would have had a hard time in your house yeah. growing up. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so you uh, fifth grade, Stephen King. Uh, are you Stephen King fans? Ooh, somebody, I want to hear from like three people. What's the first Stephen King book you read? Okay, Salem's Lot. Okay, really? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. When I was in fifth grade, I lived in Spring Creek, Nevada, and the bookmobile would show up, it was like once a week. Big fat RV on wheels, full of books. And for me, bigger, it just simply meant better. More pages equaled a better book. So I would walk in to this I would walk into this bookmobile and I would just grab the biggest thing I could find. It's like fifth grade. Have any of you read the Tommy Knockers? No. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I don't know how Stephen King feels about this book anymore. Yeah, one, of, one of his earliest ones, it's about this woman named Bobby and she's walking in her backyard, kind of in a, in a forest, and she trips over this little gray pyramid of metal sticking out of the ground. And as she starts uncovering it, it becomes clear it's a spaceship. And so the more she digs, the nearby town, you know, everything starts going wrong and people's skin is falling off. And by the end, you've got this smoking crater of a town in the, uh, of a hole in the ground that was the town. And way too heavy for me. I loved it. Fifth grade. And so I read this whole book and I knew it scared me and it wasn't a great thing for me. But I, I mean, that, that was kind of it. I, uh, I formed this imaginary contract with Stephen King, where I said, man who lives out in Maine, I will read these books as long as you write them. And so this, uh, this led me to Pet Cemetery, which led me to the book Misery. How many of you read Misery? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was in fifth grade still. <coughs> came, out, came out into the living room one morning. My mom is sitting there looking very serious, and she's got my book on her lap. And she says, son, sit down. I want to talk to you. I said, okay. And she said, have you finished this book yet? I said, no, about 100 pages in. And do any of you care if I spoil it a tiny bit? No matter. You probably heard. She, uh, 
she says, now, I read the whole thing this morning. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I got to say it made you feel sick. It made me feel sick. And I want to help you make better decisions, Josh. Did you know that she winds up cutting off his foot with an axe? And I said, why? <laughs> and she said, no, no. And do you know why she went to prison in the first place? No. Because she was killing all these kids in the hospital. How did they catch her? You know, was my response. <laughs> and this got worse and worse until I'm reaching for the book. And she says, no, no, no more, no more Stephen King in the house. You can make your own decisions one day, but that's it. So the next day the bookmobile came, and I went and I checked out It, which is by Stephen King. Even worse, possibly, you know, killer clown, mayhem, dead kids, stack them up. Bad, bad stuff. <laughs> And I couldn't, it was such a big book, I knew I couldn't just read it at school. I had to take it home and be able to, to read it constantly. So I came up with a very cunning plan. I found this book by Piers Anthony. Uh, anybody read Piers? He writes generally these harmless YA fantasy books about this magical land called Xanth. And the, each book generally has some sort of wordplay riddle that's the key to the mystery. And so I switched the cover of these two books. I even taped it down. So I take home it. And again, I don't know why it didn't occur to me, but the, the, it didn't work. The book was called The Color of Her Panties. <laughs> and this is, uh, again, like the color we're speaking of was the key to some, some dumb riddle. It could not have been tamer. But for my mom, I mean, I am like proudly displaying this book that is not it. And she grabs it out of my hand and sees what I've done. And that's, and that's kind of where Stephen King stopped between me and my mom. And I just remember the two of us staring at each other without talking for what, what seemed like minutes. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. So since then, I mean, nothing but good memories of Stephen King. I have read every book since. My mom was the same way about Prince. Mm -hmm. she, <laughs> she found out that I was smuggling Prince uh, cassettes into yeah. the house. She like vacuumed the inside of one of the cassettes out. She didn't want it in her house. So, um, so uh, the, the Tourette started evidencing itself, what age, what age were you at that point? Uh, that was fifth grade. And when did it really start to accelerate beyond the, you know, the eye, uh, eye movements and the, mm -hmm. what would, would you call it, craning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so mild tics at age six. Are any of you here because of Tourette's? Yeah, I, I mean, for, for kids it seems to be pretty common. It starts with facial stuff. Lots of blinking, maybe, maybe some noises. Uh, mine was not much more than the, the facial stuff until I was in uh, eighth grade. I was in a math class, and uh, we were in, this was in Elko, Nevada, and we had a normal school building, but there was a big metal trailer out back where we uh, had surplus for extra students because the school just kept growing. So we're in this metal trailer, and I'm taking this math test, and I'm horrified. I, I feel the urge to just start going. <clears throat> and in time with these noises, I start going like this in this metal trailer. <laughs> and I was just so, I mean, I hope everybody gets to experience pure shame at least once. That, <laughs> that hot, hot, awful embarrassment. And I just kept pretending that it's just in my head. Nobody can hear this. Everything's fine. And then this kid, he was, he was a bully sitting in front of me, he slammed his hand down on my desk and he said, oh my God, shut up! He screamed in my face. And I immediately started crying, ran out of the room, called my mom, come get me. Uh, junior high passed, I mean, thing, such, or, such is the world we have. Everybody was picking on somebody else a couple months later. And when I was a freshman in high school, I started getting bigger and I was on the basketball team and I found out I was a pretty gifted athlete. I had this terrible metal band called, uh, have you, any of you have a band? Anybody <laughs> ever been in a band that had a bad name? I, can, I could have topped it no matter what. Broken Rainbow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we would go like this. Boom! <laughs> but the point being, I was, I was popular enough. My, my dad said to me at one point, men like us do not get to be devastatingly handsome. The funny guys always got a shot. 
So I, would, I was funny, and I had my band, and I was on the basketball team, and I think those are the things most people who liked me would have told you about at the time, had you asked, versus he does all that stuff. Well, we were playing an away game on the basketball team that came down to me uh, shooting free throws on the, the foul line over and over at the end of the game. And every time I'd get up there, the crowd would chant, twitch, twitch, twitch. And so I am playing in this game with tears running down my face. And I am so furious, because how dare they? And I want to win so bad. We win the game. I flip their crowd off. <laughs> the crowd comes out of the stands. It's this stupid scene. But on, on the way home, I said to my parents, I need to know what's wrong. Can we go to a doctor? To this point, we didn't know it was Tourette's. And they chose, I mean, it didn't seem to be on my mind all that much that often. And so they didn't see the point of having me be self-conscious about it. Once I asked, it took about five minutes at the doctor for him to say, this is Tourette's. What's the next question? What do we do? I didn't want any of the pills that they use. There's really no Tourette's drug. A lot of other things they try that uh, I would always react fairly badly to. And honestly, for the rest of that, once I knew what it was, high school wasn't that bad. It just passed. I think for most of the people who liked me, it was a quirk. I, I've been on a lot of college campuses. Every college campus has somebody on a unicycle who decided, obviously, at one point, I'm going to be the unicycle guy. That's going to be my thing. <laughs> this was kind of my thing. I, I mean, <laughs> it wasn't that big of a deal. You didn't want to be the hacky sack guy. No. You were the... Then when I was 19, that's when I went on my mission for the church, and I was in Washington, D.C. Do you want to explain what a mission is for folks who are, um, are not a mission familiar? in the church? You generally men go when they're nine. Men, you go when you're 19 if you're male and 21 if you're female. Generally, it, it was two years of service, basically going out and saying, "Here's what the church teaches. We want to baptize you. Come join the church." That's that's just kind of how it works. Lots of teaching, lots of rejection. It's hard. Lots of knocking on doors. When I had been out there for a while, I was walking down a street one day with my companion and hit myself in the face as hard as I could. Boom. So my dumb little white shirt covered in blood suddenly, hand covered in blood. My companion said, are you okay? And I started to say, I don't know. Boom, boom, again and again. And suddenly I'm screaming. And we managed to get home, spent the whole day scratching myself. By the time we were done that day, these three enormous red gouges dug out of my forehead. And it was so violent and so different and so scary. I mean, obviously it was the Tourette's, but I didn't immediately think, oh, this is that, that thing you got diagnosed with as a freshman that makes you blink your eyes too much. And after that, it just got worse and worse mm -hmm. and, and worse. And so I wound up coming home a year early. I, I weigh about 260 right now. And I was 160 when I came home at this height because my body was convulsing so badly so often, I could, food could not settle in my stomach. And that's, uh, that's kind of when I started getting into the weights originally, when my dad was trying to help me put the, the weight back on. But that was the start of some really, really dark years. So, so today, my tics are far worse than they've ever been. You, you will see the tiniest fraction of it tonight because I'm trying really hard. I'm far worse at 35 than any, any point I write about in the book during what I thought were the worst times. And that kind of brings us up to speed on the Tourette's. If any of you have questions about that later, please ask. <laughs> so, um, so with this condition, why on earth would you want to be a librarian? When I told my mom I wanted to be a librarian, she said, this is the stupidest idea you've <laughs> ever had. Are you crazy? And my mom is supportive and encouraging. <laughs> Most loving woman I know. She couldn't even pretend no. this was a good idea. But by this point, I was married. You know, it was, it was really no longer a whole lot of my mom's concern. Uh, but I got, I, got, I got married during, I, you know, you mentioned the, in the introduction the Botox injections. I went for these two years where I couldn't talk at all because I was getting these injections in my throat. And I did that because I had started screaming so hard from ticks, I was getting hernias from it. Scream, scream, boom. And it was interfering with the lifting and it, things were getting so bad, I just had to try something. I mean, my fingers were dislocating, my teeth were always breaking, and I was biting through my tongue. Couldn't be out in public much. And, and if any of you are wondering why I don't really have tics while I'm talking, 
I, I don't really know, it, but, it, but it stops. So it makes me kind of sad, like my ideal situation sometimes. It's like a 45 minute one-sided conversation that nobody else can <laughs> participate in. But you're really just putting them on layaway, right? Indeed. When you're, when you're talking about that earlier? Yeah. So, well, oh, oh yeah, for the tip. Yeah, remember that. I'll come back okay. to that. So, so the, the question was about the library. I had a really hard time for the first few years of our marriage. Wh whether it was too hard for me to go to school or to work or whether I let it be too hard, do doesn't matter. The result was the same. Didn't do it. Kept going to school, kept withdrawing, kept getting hired for jobs, kept leaving after three months, a year, whatever. And I had finally gotten to a point where th this is actually kind of where some of the questions about faith started mm -hmm. because when I would ask my mom, what, what could the meaning of this possibly be? If, uh, this is not specific to Mormonism, but if you believe that someone's in charge of things, it, it's very easy to start interpreting the good things that happen as rewards, the bad things that happen to you as punishments. This was really uncomfortable to me. Things were so bad, particularly with it having gotten berserk on my mission when I knew I was doing the right thing. This was causing a very predictable crisis. And when it was so hard for me to be out in public, I could no longer be in church either. This is when I started having these questions like, what if this isn't 100% the truth? And the reason this matters as far as the Tourette's is because suddenly I had these questions about these conversations where my, my mom and others would say things like, we just gotta get it out and think how still you'll be able to sit in the next life. Think about how easy it's gonna be once this is taken from you. Really nice idea, and, I, and I, really, I really wanted to believe it was true, and it was getting harder and harder for me to believe. And so what, so what happened with libraries is once I thought, what if this life is all I get? Can't do the couch anymore. Can't, no more half measures. I've gotta figure out a way where I either give myself permission to just be disabled and lie around and be an unequal partner in this marriage, or I gotta make something happen. My decision-making process and my problem-solving process is idiotic. The next day, I walked into the quietest place I knew, and I screamed, ah! I asked for a job application, and that was the public library. And I knew it would either chew me up and spit me out immediately, and I could let myself off the hook, or I'd be okay. Now, it's probably, there are a lot of reasons why I love libraries more, more than anything, and I probably don't even need to go into them. You can tell by now. But originally what I, what I really needed from it was I knew that I would be exposed, I'd be vulnerable. It is literally impossible for me to spend one comfortable minute in a library. And that is because, and that is why libraries force me to ask questions about myself. I'm forced to, to ask questions the way I wish everybody was when they're in the library. Because in order for me to not ruin everybody else's experience when they're there, I have to ask, what else can I try? What's going on with the lighting? How am I sitting? How am I breathing? What else can I try so that this is easier for me and easier for them? I would not have that sort of desper desperate curiosity if I were sitting on my couch or I were somewhere where I feel safer. And now that my five-year-old son is possibly having Tourette's, there's another layer to that. I don't know where else I can be besides the library because it is what makes me panicky and freaked out to figure it out. It's, it's kind of like the lab. So predictable reasons, the books, the cheesy stuff library school recruiters say, like, you will be the steward of democracy. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds good when they're signing you up. Are there library school recruiters? Oh, that's how I went. I mean, I was working as a substitute in the library. Matt, were you recruited? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've got a master's degree in, in library science. But when they came, they were very honey-tongued, and I was vulnerable. Couldn't get out my credit card fast enough. Now, I, no, I, I don't regret it at all. It's what got me my job and, and has kept me rising. But that's, that's why libraries. I'm still waiting for somebody to say, why not libraries? Are you concerned about the future of the library? Not really. I, there's a lot, of re, a lot of interesting questions. It just depends. Uh, you can't talk about reimagining a library without the patrons. 
And when I try to reimagine the library patron, they never look too different. Still asking questions, still needing things. The, uh, a lot of the people I know who worry the most about it are the most nostalgic for a library that has already passed, in mm -hmm. my opinion, at least in my opinion. And when a library is paid for by the public's money, there's an interesting balance. You, you owe the public, of which we are part, you know, librarians as well, as much of what they want as possible, you know, without, it, it sounds awful, but you don't want to just lower the, blo the bar and say, okay, we're going to be block, free Blockbuster, or free Redbox, or whatever. No, I'm not concerned at all. I could find you like 20 hysterical people who work on my floor who'd cry their <laughs> eyes out. We could all just get under the covers and sob. I'm not worried. There you go. So um, what's, the, what's been the response of people who uh, work with you or visit the library as far as when they're confronted with your ticks? You know, you don't see or hear a lot of it at the library, like I said. It's harder on the people I work with in the back because when I'm out on the desk, I try. I grind down on it. Um, there's an interesting trade-off. If my ticks are vocal, I can sometimes switch them to physical ticks while I need to. That's generally what I do at the library. So I think if you asked most of the people who see me out on the floor, they'd say, yeah, he's real twitchy, not he's real noisy. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, he hits himself, he doesn't yell. It's kind of the opposite in the back room. The response in general has been pretty, ex I mean, pe people are, are generally nice. Yeah. In, in most cases with, with anything I've found. It's a lot more likely for somebody to say to me, are you okay? And hey, shut up. You know, and when it goes to that, I'm, I'm fine. I love to fight. I'm very good at it. I don't lose a lot of staring contests, and and I, I don't I don't like that stuff. But I'm not afraid of it. Yeah. And I don't apologize for myself anymore. Um, but that's that's generally the reaction yeah. to my face, at least. Now uh, you wanted to get back to kind of the ticks going on layaway when you're like right now you're not manifesting a lot of the, mm -hmm. the symptoms of your Tourette's. Um, but you said that there'll be a price later, potentially. Not right now. Actually, right now, I'm not trying very hard anymore. Mm -hmm. The urge is kind of fading. And what happens is, th this is not true just of Tourette's. You're always getting better at whatever it is you do. That's just how it works. There's no off switch to adaptation. People who work in chairs all day start to get shape, shaped like chairs. People who only do one exercise start to become, you know, the bros. You can always spot them. They're shaped like the bench press. I am always, I'm, I'm usually. They got the pipe cleaner yeah. legs and the giant I'm shoulders. You, I am usually getting better at having ticks because that's kind of what I practice. That's what I rehearse. That's the hard thing. If I could get more time without them, we would start scaling back towards someone more like a person without Tourette's. Mm -hmm. Now when I talk, and I've had you know, more or less 30 un 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 uninterrupted moments comparatively, the urge goes away. Similar things happen when I play the guitar, when I, when I, when I speak, sometimes when I write, sometimes when I read. So when, what you mentioned about the cost, what he was referring to is if I'm at the library and I'm just having to stifle it by, by pure will and spite, once they do come out, it's going to be worse. It can vent here and there, and that's ideal, or the pipe can blow once it finally comes out. I wish Jeanette was here. You, you could hear some stories about the poor woman I've tricked into sleeping next to me for 12 years. Mm -hmm. but, th but that's it. There seems to be a balancing of the scales. If I'm white knuckling it, it's gonna be bad once it comes, no matter how long I hold on to it for. Gotcha. Um, now, along with the seemingly, you know, odd decision to become a librarian with Tourette's, uh, there's also the, the bodybuilding and the weightlifting uh, that has made you the world's strongest librarian. Now, if I was someone who hit myself, I wouldn't be working out frequently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> it, you know, and, and part of that's, it's all about leverages. Yeah. <laughs> I can hit you a lot harder than I can hit me just because I'm attached to me. That's just the way gotcha. it works. But, I mean, I've seen one of the videos on YouTube, and, you know, I would imagine that, you know, I could house myself. You know, <laughs> I, 
How, uh, so let's talk about, you, you, your dad got you into it, um, and you found that when you were working out, you were more able to be in control of your body. Lift, lifting actually makes the tics worse, almost invariably, and that's kind of been a why, must. Why it's happening? While it's happening? Not or? while it's happening, okay. afterwards. Yeah. So there's been kind of a misconception that, oh, he lifts and they go away. I lift and they get worse. Uh, what, I, uh, what I have, and it could have been a lot of different things. It just happened to be the weights, you know, for some different reasons and some people I met. It's uh, when I, I speak a lot to groups of kids with disabilities, and the ones who generally seem to be thriving are the ones who are always getting better at something. And the more specifically they can measure that thing, the more confident it seems to make them. There's nothing abstract about strength. You're either stronger today than you were yesterday, or you're not. It's a number. It was what I could measure. And it was the only time every day where I felt like I had some control over my body. Now, this was in the early days. Once I got into it with this guy, uh, par part of the book is me meeting this autistic Air Force tech sergeant, master of hand-to-hand -hand combat, trained shooters, just, just the most incredible, brilliant, mysterious, hard person I've ever met. And Adam was a professional strongman, performing strongman. If you think like the, like the guy in the leopard skin suit, turn of the century circus stuff, there are still people out there like that. I am one of those people now. And so I can, Why don't you explain the difference between like a bodybuilder and a strongman? Why don't you explain it? I'm curious to hear what you'd say. Well, I'm assuming that, that people who are doing a lot of the, you know, they'll do more barbells and things like that, and it, they're really going for definition and bulk and whatnot, and that doesn't seem to be the goal of, of what you're doing. No, not at all. I can't help how I look. I, I've given up on it long ago. <laughs> Bodybuilding is simply aesthetics. Mm -hmm. It's as much muscle, the pursuit of symmetry, the pursuit of the, the perfect body, whatever that means to you. You can get very- I failed. <laughs> you got oh, yeah. your, yeah, you're a young man yet. Yes, all right. <laughs> uh, you can get big, surprisingly big, without getting strong. You can't get strong without getting bigger. So for me, that's been the obsession is, I, I mean, back to the bros, mm -hmm. good grief. I mean, you can go in any gym in America on a Monday, everyone's bench pressing, everyone's doing curls, Everyone's glaring at themselves in the mirror. No one's strong at all. It's very rare to find someone strong. And it's because they're, they're looking for the look. They want to be able to swagger. Um, there's a rampant disease called imaginary lat syndrome I want you all to start looking for. <laughs> the lat is this big muscle right here. I want you to watch. The next time you see some guy walking like he's carrying buckets, <laughs> you look. There's nothing there, <laughs> nine times out of 10. So for strength, it's generally about performance. So I mm -hmm. tend to fixate on the number, but again, because that's how I proved to myself more than yesterday, more than yesterday. So for strong man, it's, it's the events, it's the lifts, it's how strong are you, not how do you look. Most people, if they focused on simply getting stronger, they'd wind up being very happy with how their body would look. There's really just no way around it. Mm -hmm. So that involves, for you, you, you do, you lift boulders or large rocks. I would call them boulders, but you might call them large rocks. Uh, bending spikes, you can tear decks of cards. Yeah, that sort of thing. But that's not that's not how you work out. That's like not, how well, you it, it it depends. Okay. People always ask me how much I can lift, and my numbers would not impress anybody who is like any elite lifter of any kind. And because my ticks are so physical, and I've got such hard mileage on my body, I'm always hurt. I mean, if I told you I'm going to do a bench press competition in ten weeks, inevitably during that ten weeks, I'd get injured just because of a tick and I'd have to switch lifts. I wouldn't make it to that competition. So I'm always starting over. When I say stronger than yesterday, that's exactly what it means. I never know what yesterday's gonna be. Sometimes, I mean, my number's cut in half again. So my options are always, what can I do without any pain? And that's why I do so many things. I, I, do, I do stone lifting with the giant boulders. I can take a frying pan and roll it up with my hands and put it through your watch.
I can tear decks of cards in half and break horseshoes with my hands. It's dumb, it's kind of fun, but it's, uh, it's I, I do a little, a little bit of everything. I like to run, I like to wrestle, I do a lot of grappling, I mean, just. Has anyone challenged you for the title of World's Strongest Librarian since you constantly. claimed it for yourself? Yeah, and again, that's a, that's a good question. What, what would, pr I wanna hear from somebody. What would prove to you definitively that one person was stronger than another person? Arm wrestling? Anything else? <laughs> Did anyone bring a frying pan? <laughs> I want to go home and get one. I'm right across the street. <laughs> oh, all right, I'm good. So, so we had we had arm wrestling and we had frying pans. So these are these are two fine examples because they're both specifics. Is the man who can beat everyone in the world at arm wrestling stronger than? the marathon runner who can put together 26 five-minute miles in a row? Is the ballerina with incredible body control and the ability to differentiate joints in these micro movements and be on her toes for an hour, is she stronger than the man who can do 30 pull-ups in a row? If I can, if I at 260 pounds can deadlift 600 pounds, and you, the female who weighs 150 pounds, can deadlift three times your body weight, even though it's a lower number, you're probably stronger than I am at the deadlift. The question is irrelevant without some context to it. So when people say to me, how much can you lift? I generally just say, 1,000 pounds. Because <laughs> for people for whom that is a serious question, that's also a serious answer. And they just go, whoa. They don't think to ask what, what lift, how far can you move it, just, just whatever. <laughs> So, what was, the, what was the start of that question? I can't remember. Uh, can we rewind the video? Uh, well, let me, let, let, let's do a quick little, uh, what's the biggest misconception about people with Tourette's? Probably that Tourette's is simply the, what's called coprolalia, that's the uncontrollable yelling of obscenities, and it's real. I learned this a couple years ago, uh, it, it can actually exist without Tourette's, and I didn't know that. But it, it makes for great Hollywood Tourette's. It's definitely where you get the be best comedic mileage. It's, it's rare, even in extreme cases like mine. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been around people who have it. It's very startling. And it's uh, very interesting that it all comes from the same place. But it's, uh, that, that would be my bet. All right, biggest misconception about librarians. About librarians? That we can't roll frying pans up with our hands. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, uh, I mean, you can probably guess it. Stere you know, stereotypes always have some legitimacy to them. Yeah. And I, I still know plenty of librarians who are exactly what you're thinking of when you think of a librarian. It's, yeah. ch it's changing. Uh, I would say the biggest misconception about libraries is just that they're the place where the books are. That's definitely changing. Gotcha. What about biggest misconception about Mormons? I don't know. Pro you know. You know what? Probably polygamy. Mm-hmm. We've all, we've all still got a million wives. Uh, the, the reorganized LDS church still does practice polygamy. The Mormon church hasn't for, you know, I don't know how long, it's, it's been a while. Um, but it's hard to convince yeah. people of that. Did you read that. Under the Banner of Heaven? Mm -hmm. I, after I read that book, I'm like, I'm never going to Utah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lawless country onto its own. There are some, I've been to some of those weird little towns in that book, and it's, uh, it's interesting stuff. I'm sure it's lovely, but <laughs> read the book. Read the book. You'll never want to go to Utah. Uh, <laughs> and I, and, like, and I, just so I'm clear, I have no problem with Mormons. I, I don't have anything against any religion. It just, uh, just some things have changed. All right. Um, I want to open this up to uh, the folks who've come to uh, hear you speak. Mm -hmm. Um, so if people have questions, if you can raise your hand, there's someone with a microphone, I believe. Oh. Or there was there. And you guys, I, I, will, lady over there. I will hang out tonight as long as anybody wants to, so we're, we're certainly not in a rush. <laughs> and we're done. Oh, over okay. there. <laughs> I, 
I, I will get into it sometime. I, uh, for me, it's generally a question of, I, I don't want to pretend like I'm more discriminated than I am. So, am I going to watch another show from start to finish? That's the question. Like, I, I watched all five se seasons of Alias, hated every single episode. <laughs> Had to finish. <laughs> so, uh, Are you much of a TV watcher? I can't imagine you might have much time. Um, I, I do. I watch quite a bit of TV. Um, so I, I, I would definitely watch it. I've never been really impressed with the adaptations of his work, so, and I don't really expect that to change. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you fall asleep if the ticks are really bad? I sleep about four hours a night, and I take a nap in the afternoon. Once I'm asleep, it's fine. I, I, I have heard that some people have ticks when they're asleep. I don't, apparently. But it's really hard for me to relax to the point where I can actually drop off. That's, a, that's when I do all my reading and a lot of my writing, though. I, honestly, you can get used to anything. You forget how good you can feel. And so at this point, I don't know that I'd trade fewer books for more sleep. <laughs> I don't need beauty sleep anymore. <laughs> You're as beautiful as Obviously, today. yeah. We'd just be gilding the lily. Um, ah! What do you account for that time period when you were working on the breathing and you seemed to be able to manage the ticks so much, mm -hmm. so much more than you are now? You know, that's something we didn't even cover tonight, which I should have. When I sold this book, it was going to be a book about how I'd cured myself. I was in the middle of a year with almost zero ticks. I mean, nothing. And so when I sold this book, it was going to be about how I had was started trying to replicate the process with other people with Tourette's. And this had to do with some of the experiments I did with this, this guy, Adam Glass, a strong man. And it did start out with breathing, a lot of that. The, the goal, what I realized was that I never take a full breath, hardly ever. And so my goal, and it took months to get there, was just to take a couple of breaths in a row with no ticks full breaths. I mean, like a month of just trying to get a full breath. And so what happened at that time, you know, I can only speculate, I was able to turn one breath into two and two into three. And as long as I was practicing breathing in a totally tickless state, it just kind of started going away. And I thought I was done. When I sold the book, when I saw my son start having ticks, when a friend got cancer, when my sister's multiple sclerosis all kicked in, like, at, like all in the same week, I revved back up so hard, so fast, I've never come back down again. I think I'll get back to it. For whatever reason, the things that were working then are not working now. The process of solving it, I believe, is still the same. It is, you're always getting better at whatever you're doing. I'm always getting better at have tick, having ticks. What can I do to practice having fewer ticks more times a day? And right now, breathing's not, I'm not able to do that. So beyond you, that, I, I think I'd be pretending I knew things I don't. Would you ever actually miss having them? They'd become so much a part of your life. Would it be a point where you'd be, you know, wouldn't know what to do with yourself without them? Or? I don't know. It's, it's my gimmick. Would, all, would any of you be here otherwise? <laughs> no, I mean... Um, you still have that strong man thing going I try not, I try not. I try not to think a lot yeah. about what if it was another way, because it's not another way. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why I'm very uncomfortable. I always get billed as being inspirational and courageous, and I feel like most of the time I hate this, and I run on pure spite and desperation, but I don't know what else to do. And it seems to help other people, so I'm gonna keep doing it, because I'm not gonna tell people what to be inspired by. So, I'd love not to have it. I hate it. But I've been through a lot of Adam Glass's self-defense workshops, and he always uses his example of the worst thing you can think, if you ever get attacked, suddenly things are moving fast, is I can't believe this is happening. Anytime you spend thinking, I can't believe this is happening, is time you're not reacting. And I've finally gotten to the point where I can say, this is happening. You know, and as soon as you can say this is happening, you can say, what now? What now? So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. If I had not had that year off, it would be harder than it is because now it feels more like a matter of when it's bad, what am I not seeing? 
What am I not asking? And I very well may figure something else out. Yeah, and my brain doesn't know the difference between good stress and bad stress. Things are pretty awesome right now. They, they are. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Other question? Right there? Yes, ma'am. Not really. I'm going to stand up. I'm tired of sitting. So the way I can explain it best to most of you is because you've all, you all know what it's like to sneeze. If you can think of the urge to sneeze where it's just at that point where you just got to let it go or you're going to die, or, but, but not really, right? I mean, I don't think there's a sneeze that you simply can't hold in. But what happens if you hold it in? It, it's, it's, it doesn't feel good. There's no resolution. Life or death, you can hold it in. The urge to have a tick is similar. I can hold it in if I have to. If I let it out, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like or what it's going to sound like. And once the urge is gone, it starts rebuilding immediately. But it's everywhere. Everywhere. So, so yes, that, that's a, if, if you think about having to sneeze every second of every day, and you've got to hold it in, that's how I hold it in. Because yeah, I don't quite have to do it. But it takes more energy to hold them in than to have the ticks. Yes, ma'am. I love your shoes. My best friend's <laughs> husband has shoes like that and he uh, loves to dance. What about you? Do you I love, love to, to dance. dance. These were originally my dancing mm -hmm. shoes. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I generally don't dress up at all. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm playing dress up in big boy clothes. <laughs> when it's a library, I get dressed up. Yep. So they were dancing shoes. Today they're my Mark, my Mark Twain and Hartford shoes. Mm -hmm. Was that the question and the comment? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> I was going to had a question about your physical size. Do you think that has an effect upon you? Because I was thinking... <laughs> Uh, what if he were a midget? Let's say you were the world's tallest midget or something, and you're always looking up at people even though you're very tall for a midget. And you're kind of the opposite of that. You're always kind of looking down at people. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that has any difference at all? I mean, obviously other people with this problem, if you want to put it that way, uh, have different approaches. Does this matter at all to you because you are so tall? I think it could definitely play into things. Nothing gives me the urges like knowing people can see me, being out in public. And, I, and it's harder for me to hide. Yeah, I was going to say, you're, you're kind of hard to miss. Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, if I'm, if I'm here and your eyes are open and you're looking in my direction, you're going to see me. And right. whether it's subconscious or conscious, I can't pretend. And my other question is, do you look at other people when, when you see their <laughs> faces and they, you've just done that and they sort of scowl or they make some physical appearance that... Uh, you're aware of that, oh, this man is rather odd or something like that. How do you feel? I don't really worry about it anymore. I don't lose you a lot don't. of staring okay. contests. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I mean, I, I can explain myself, and uh, if, if things start moving fast, they start moving fast. It's okay. <laughs> How did I meet my wife? That's a great question. I actually met my wife during the two years when I couldn't talk. We'd been married for about eight months before Jeanette heard my speaking voice. Very interesting way to get to know somebody. The, the story we have of how we met is not quite as interesting. I was home, from, uh, home for the summer from college, working at a gold mine in Nevada, and she had taken her first job out of grad school about 18 months before that and moved to Elko. And Jeanette's a folklorist. She was managing the Western Folklife Center there. And it was actually pretty lame. My mom came home from church and said, I found the perfect girl for you. That's, <laughs> and she was right. That's it. That's the story. Mm -hmm. You know, I will, I, will, I will tell you a sweet story, though. We, our wedding was about two weeks away, and I was having this terrible time with ticks. And we were house sitting and lying on, lying on a bed in this house talking to each other. And I was really trying to talk her out of marrying me. And I was saying, no, you don't get it. I get depressed. 
it'll drive you away. People can't handle it. I've lost these friends. And she finally said, she said, not being with you is so much harder than being with you when it's bad. Thought, well, damn it, I'm never going to hear anything like that again. <laughs> and that's, uh, that, that was the end of it. Yeah. I think she was more patient with me than she should have been sometimes, but, uh, but we got there. The book should be called The World's Biggest Softy. You're so sweet. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. I'm, I'm an absolute pushover until I'm not. <laughs> and that's how I want it. Probably have time for one or two more questions. Hi, um, my name is Donna Hagiga, and I'm the Chief Development Officer here at the library. So I just want to thank you for being such a great library champion. Um, and my question is, you were telling us about how you first sensed, uh, you were on stage when you first sensed the twitching. And you mentioned also that your son may possibly have Tourette's. What is the indicators generally for when children develop Tourette's? Is there some sort of a, a dramatic onset like that? Does it run in families? It is genetic. Mm -hmm. The race is on for the genes. We don't know what to blame yet. There is a lot of speculation, but that, yeah, yeah, it's genetic. But my parents didn't have Tourette's, obviously. I do. My son has like a 25% greater chance of having it because I have it, but it's not a sure thing, of course. So, it's a, it, it tends to be, from what I've read, very common, manifesting between ages five and eight. I'm really extreme in a lot of ways. The severity of my symptoms is way beyond what most people will deal with. The fact that it really got going when I was 20 is very odd. So, yes, it's genetic. Yes, it's all over the map, which which gives me some hope, because if Max has it, there's no guarantee he'll have a case anything like mine. Maybe he doesn't have it at all. It can also make it tougher to treat. You look at three people with Tourette's, what works for one might absolutely wreck the life of another. Thank you, you guys made this so easy. <laughs> Isn't it good to be us? <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh, for being here. Um, this was a, a really important meeting tonight to meet someone like you and uh, the challenges that you've faced and that you've chose, chosen the profession of librarian um, at a time of significant change in the world of libraries. Um, and uh, you're a, a truly inspirational uh, young man and we uh, thank you for being here in Hartford very My much. My pleasure, thank you. And we also want to thank uh, Jacques Lamar, uh, the ever entertaining Jacques Lamar. Woo! We all love in Hartford, and um, who does so much for uh, for this city and for uh, the arts and, and our culture. And he also has, as you know, a great sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, thank you for bringing Josh to the library and uh, partnering with us on this. Uh, very happy that you're here too. Um, as I mentioned, this, this uh, program tonight is part of the adult summer learning series. Uh, it's not just for children uh, to have summer <coughs> learning programs. So uh, the library has an adult summer learning program. Uh, you can register online for that program. And uh, we have a, a weekly uh, prize drawings on Fridays uh, where you can win uh, guided tour passes to um, the Mark Twain House. Um, and at the end, on August 23rd, uh, for those who are um, sort of uh, have uh, signed up and are blogging with us about what they think about the books they're reading, uh, there's also a Kindle Fire that will be part of, um, part of our drawing. So you can sign up at uh, hplct.org, and uh, we encourage you, uh, many of you already are great readers, but of course we encourage you to be readers. Uh, we encourage you to read Josh's book. Uh, and we encourage you to uh, support your libraries, uh, both this one and the ones from communities where some of you may live. So thank you again. Uh, the book is for sale in the back, and if you've got your book already, uh, Josh uh, will sign that book for you as well and, uh, and answer any of your questions. Thanks again, and uh, hope to see you here soon.